afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is John Gear. I'm head of the Unity Project and also senior advisor to Chancellor Deermeyer. I'm excited about the opportunity to have this conversation and to introduce Ambassador Marakava and also Morgan Ortegas. The ambassador has been a major political figure both in Ukraine and across Europe, across the world, frankly. And of course, for the last two years, she's been in the office for three, she's been playing a pivotal role in what's going on in Ukraine after the Russian invasion of that country. So she has been at ground zero, so to speak, of these international conversations. And having her at Vanderbilt is just such an opportunity. We're also very fortunate to have Morgan Ortegas not only be part of our Vanderbilt community, but also to have moved to Nashville a few years ago. Morgan uh, worked as the spokesperson for Mike Pompeo when he was Secretary of State. She traveled the world with the Secretary of State. She knows a huge amount of, about international relations, and having her lead this conversation is amazing. She's also in the U.S. Naval Reserve as, a, as an officer, so it was just great to, to have her here. This effort, what we call uh, Dialogue with Diplomats, is in fact part of a broader initiative called Dialogue Vanderbilt that is attributable to our, our Chancellor's leadership. He is the one who spearheaded this, who's led this, and we are just fortunate to be part of it because Dialogue Vanderbilt is so important to this country at this particular moment in time. That is that we must have the ability to have free and open discussion, respectful discussion about our many differences, which there are so many. And yet we know that the many, in many quarters in this country and around the globe, that is not happening. And Vanderbilt seeks to lead on this effort through dialogue, through dialogue Vanderbilt. And so this is just really critical to have these kinds of uh, conversations. I also think it's important to, to thank Morgan in particular because she is the one who brought this idea to our attention and we all seized on it immediately and we'll be continuing to have these kinds of conversations in the coming, coming weeks and years. Further, I want to thank the Friedman family because they have been able to provide the kind of support to the Unity Project and to Dialogue Vanderbilt that makes these kinds of conversations uh, possible. It's now my honor and distinct pleasure to introduce Daniel Deermeyer, our chancellor, our leader, who has just shown so much vision on so many different fronts. He is an internationally renowned political scientist and management scholar. He is the ninth chancellor of Vanderbilt University. Mm -hmm. Since joining Vanderbilt in 2020, Chancellor Deermeyer has led an ambitious program of growth and advancement. Under his leadership, the, the university has risen in stature, successfully launched, for example, a $3.2 billion funding campaign that will allow us to meet our ambitions. Our research dollars have topped the $1 billion mark during his time uh, as chancellor. And he continues to reaffirm the university's commitment to free and open exchange. His efforts to make Vanderbilt further a destination for the very best faculty and the very best students. While we create a culture of radical collaboration and personal growth for every member of our community. Before arriving at Vanderbilt, Chancellor Deermeyer served in leadership roles at the Stanford Graduate School, the Kellogg School of Management, and the University of Chicago, where he served both as the Dean of the Harris Public Policy School and also Provost of the University of Chicago. Please welcome Chancellor Daniel Deermeyer. Well, thank you, John, for this lovely introduction. And good afternoon to all of you. I am pleased to be here with you and to welcome Ambassador Oksana Makarova to Vanderbilt. Events like this are key to our effort to bring the world to Vanderbilt as we bring Vanderbilt to the world. Hosted by Dialogue Vanderbilt, as John just mentioned, and our project on unity in American democracy, this conversation is also a shining example of our effort to foster civil discourse, free expression, and an open exchange of ideas. As some universities shy away from events that stir passions or debate our university community is leaning in with open forums like these made possible in part by our culture of respectful civic discourse. Vanderbilt must be a place 
where our community can ask challenging questions, share bold ideas, and engage in productive discussions with people who may hold opposing views. This year, among other events, we have already hosted interfaith events with leaders from Muslim and Jewish communities, a talk on the state of US democracy with former Congresswoman Liz Cheney, and a panel discussion on race equity and affirmative action with writer and political commentator Melissa Harris Perry. But this afternoon, we consider the war in Ukraine. Nashville sits more than 5,300 miles from Ambassador Makarova's embattled capital city of Kyiv. But the impact and ramifications of the war in her country reverberate across the globe, including right here in our city and on our campus. So, as a privilege for Vanderbilt to provide a forum for this conversation, which I now will turn over to Morgan Ategas and Ambassador Makarova. Thank you and welcome to Vanderbilt. Good afternoon. It's great to be back in Vanderbilt. Um, I just want to say a special thank you to the Chancellor and to Dr. John Gear. Um, we were just joking about how I am the good idea fairy. I'm always coming up with uh, ideas and events for Vanderbilt. And it's just been such a privilege and an honor to partner uh, with you both. And thank you to those of you who have been to some of our previous amb ambassador lecture series. So excited to have you here today. Um, just in case you haven't been to one of these, uh, I will ask the first round of questions, but we do love to open these up to the audience and to give all of you an opportunity to ask a question of our, uh, of our special and honored guest today. And speaking of that, I just have to brag on her a little. We were at the Gridiron Dinner Saturday night in DC which is the oldest uh, association for journalists in Washington, D.C., and she received a standing ovation. She was a rock star of the show, uh, which is no surprise. So let's get right down to business ambassador. Um, we all obviously have, have been watching the news for the past two years. We know uh, what happened, uh, very sadly, the worst war on European soil since World War II. And I was, I've been in uh, Ukraine several times with Secretary of State uh, Pompeo whenever I worked for him, but I was also there in May of 21. And in Lviv, it felt like the World War II movies that I've always watched, because my grandfather was at the Battle of the Bulge, and I don't know if, if many of you probably watch these movies, and when you see, when you hear the bombs and when you see what's going on and when you talk to people, uh, it, it almost feels like a scene out of a movie, right? It's hard to believe that this is happening on European soil. So catch us up. Uh, where are we today in the war? What's the status? Thank you, Morgan, and it's such a pleasure to be back on campus and to be back actually to Nashville, which changed so much since I was here last time in 2003. Uh, but great to be with, with, with all of you, and thank you for actually putting focus on Ukraine, because in many ways this war, of course, is existential for us, but it's very consequential for all of us. And unfortunately, or fortunately now, the outcome of this war will define in which world we all will live, whether we will return to international law and, and uh, peace, or the challenges that are ahead of us are much bigger than just uh, Putin's attack against Ukraine, because it's not just about Ukraine. Uh, you said it's like out of the movie, and you know, during the first months of this full-fledged invasion, of course, the war started in 2014, but uh, you know, then it went, we signed this Minsk Accord, it's not particularly fair to Ukraine, but we uh, tried to implement them and, f and through diplomatic solution get to peace. But when the full-fledged war started, and of course we all moved to doing what we need to do 24-7, fighting for Ukraine, including my team at the embassy, but during the first months, every morning I would wake up and the first thought would be, was that a bad dream? It was so surreal and so difficult to believe in that, uh, you know, th there was that feeling everywhere. Now, where we are two years from the beginning of this, so 755 days exactly today. Um, first, of course, we denied Putin the right to take us in three days or three weeks or whatever the plan was. Ukrainians didn't surrender. Ukrainians kept fighting. Uh, so he miscalculated on that. 
but also our partners and U.S. And I, I always use the opportunity to say thank you to American people, to administration, to president, to Congress, on a very strong bipartisan basis, because Putin miscalculated that as well. And the support we were able to receive during these two years allowed us to A, not fall, liberate 50% of what Putin already occupied since uh, February 22, liberate the Black Sea. This is one of the biggest gains of 2023, when uh, just seven months ago we were discussing how to get Russians to agree to our exports to be inspected faster and, and uh, uh, got through the Black Sea. Well, now with the naval drones, we destroyed one third or damaged of Russian Black Sea fleet, and we're doing the exports on our own. Now, so, you know, right now the war is very much a hot war. It's a very long front line, 700 miles, longer than, you know, a distance from uh, many places in the United States. Uh, it's very difficult. The Russians are trying to exploit the situation that we are running out of missiles. And because there are discussions and delays, and we really need that supplementary budget in order to be able to, to get and stay the, stay the, stay the course. Uh, so we see the attacks on Odessa, on Kiev, on Kherson, on Dnipro, literally on a daily basis. And unfortunately, they are reaching you know, the residential areas and schools, musical school couple of days ago, or just private housing, and it's horrible, and it's war crime after war crime. And we're not even, uh, we don't even know everything that happens on the territories we do not control, but we can assume, we can know what happens there after we've seen what happened in Bucha, just after 33 days under occupation, or what happened in Kherson after one year of occupation. Or we know that Mariupol, you know, and uh, a lot of people saw the 20 days in Mariupol. Now it's 755 days of total destruction, tortures, killing, and rape. So the war is still there. Uh, it's very much hot war. We still can win it, but we need more weapons for it. So right now we're at a very pivotal time and point in that war. From this we can either get more support and win, or the situation can get worse. And it's really a make it or break it point. I love what you had to say about the fighting spirit of the Ukrainians. Um, when I was in Kyiv in February of 20 with Secretary Pompeo, I think I told you this story. We visited um, some uh, injured Ukrainian soldiers who had been fighting in Crimea. Um, and one of them, when he saw Secretary Pompeo, was so excited that he took, uh, he, took, he took off his special forces badge to give it to Pompeo. And I know he carries it to that day. And when I was in Lviv last talking to people, I, I, that's been my one observation. Every time I go to Ukraine, I said they're going to fight to the last man, woman, and child for their country. And I think it's such a testament to your fighting spirit. You brought up the supplemental. There's nothing hotter in the news right now. And, and in the you know Vanderbilt's spirit of, of debate, um, one of the holdups is obviously in the House. And so you have some people uh, in the United States, some members of Congress that are saying, we're not protecting our own border, so why should we protect Ukraine's border? How do you answer the question to the skeptical Americans who may not want Putin to win, but don't necessarily see the, the benefit of giving you the aid or think that we have to take care of our domestic problems here first? How do you answer those questions? Well, there are different different concerns that we hear from people. So if it's uh, framed, as you said, you know, there is, of course, there are different challenges. There is always different challenges. But the US is a great country. And you have this expression, you can walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> that, that This is it, you know. I think US is, is one of the, or if not the leader of the free world. And you can do that. Yes, you can, you can sort out your challenges, and you can uh, champion and the democracy and help those who are fighting for it like us. But, but uh, of course, it's not just about that. So uh, throughout these two years, all supplementary discussions have been difficult, frankly. And uh, we had to work a lot, not only with the members uh, on the Hill, but with constituencies and with academia and with others to explain, first, why this is the right thing to do, why this is war that has effect on all of us and why we are fighting for the principles and values on which this country is built. And if we cannot defend ourselves and allow, if we allow Putin to win in Ukraine, then everything we say, whether in UN or in any international fora, about 
values matter and that we have to uh, stop and stand up to bullies and we have to protect democracies, then how do you do that uh, if you do it in one area and you don't do it in another, right? So it, it's, 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 it's kind of from the moral perspective, it's the right thing to do. Now, from the national security perspective, look at any paper that uh, talks about the U.S. national interest. We are fighting with the enemy that is threatening the U.S. I mean, let's listen to what Putin says. He has been anti-American and anti-democratic and anti-free world from the very beginning. He is actually very consistent in everything he says since the day he became the president. And every time he was re-elected, if you consider that election, or every time he replaced himself with so-called president who then uh, held the seat for him and then replaced back because there were some rules that did not allow Putin to just be crowned and continue until uh, the end of his life. Uh, he has been always threatening everyone, Ukraine, Baltic states. He actually not only talked about it, he attacked Republic of Georgia in 2008. He attacked Republic of Moldova with creating this Transnistria problem even earlier than that. He shut down MH17, he attacked Ukraine in 2014, he poisoned people in London. So uh, he, he has been very consistent in actually being an autocratic dictator who threatens everyone in the free world. And uh, also, if you look from the transparency and accountability perspective, we are using this support in a very responsible way. We're reporting literally on a daily basis. You have three inspector generals who, from Pentagon State Department and USAID, who are checking uh, how we're using it. We are, th that's about not only the budget support, which is the smaller portion of the supplementary budget, which we actually get as funding, but also the defense support, which we are not getting as, as money. The money stays here, create jobs here in so many states, and we're getting the good. So whether you look at it from the moral perspective, from the national security perspective, from the efficiency perspective, this is, this is a good and very useful thing to do also. And of course, it's existential for us. But you know, we are answering the question not whether Ukraine will survive. We are answering the question whether democracies can defend themselves. And this is the question which is very important for all of us to answer, not just to Ukraine or Europe, because it's, it's, it's way beyond just a European problem. How important is it for you to be in NATO? Very important. Look, um, we have been neutral, and we had neutrality in our constitution when Russia attacked us the first time. Sweden and Finland have been neutral. They were hoping that that will actually keep them from Russian invasion, because we all knew who is the aggressor on, in our part of the world. That was not secret to any of us. Uh, but I think what Russia did, completely without provocation, unjustified, unprovoked aggression from Russia to all of us in the region, and especially to Ukraine in 14 and 22nd, has clearly shown to us that the concept of buffer zones or neutrality no longer works. We either stay together as the club of countries that believe in the same values and defend collectively each other, or you know, we, we will be threatened by, by Russia or other uh, autocrats. So Ukraine believes in NATO. Ukraine wants to be in NATO. The majority of population supports that. It's in our constitution. We also believe we have a lot to add to NATO with our battle-tested army, with brave defenders and resilient nation that is ready to stand up to, uh, to a country like Russia. We have a lot to add to, to NATO. Now, we understand that requires a unanimous decision. We understand there are challenges related to uh, us being country in active war. That never happened. That uh, country was uh, uh, be became member while at war. But we are working towards it. We are making reforms. We are making our forces interoperable with NATO. And ultimately, you know, uh, we believe that Ukraine will be in NATO. You know, speaking, you were just talking about um, Putin, and there was a sham election, of course, over the weekend, as you al al alluded to. Um, 
Uh, what I am curious about, and we did have the Finnish ambassador here. I think he was actually our first guest as a part of the lecture series that we that we first did here at Vanderbilt. And and I know you know him well. And his perspective on Putin was interesting because he had spent he had been the Finnish ambassador to Russia and had spent so much time with Putin. He felt like that, and and I think he still believes this that Putin hasn't actually paid a price at home with the Russian people, or not enough of one. Um, now this has been almost a year ago that we that we had him. But you know, I'm curious again. The sham election results are not indicative of where the Russian people are, but. You guys have done an amazing job uh, with their navy and the Black Sea, and you've done an amazing job defending yourselves over the past two years. Where do you think Putin actually stands at home with the Russian people? Is the Finnish ambassador's assessment from a year ago still accurate, or do you think there are cracks and rifts between Putin and the people in, of Russia? Well, yeah, um, Finnish ambassador Miko is, is, is a good friend. He's also, by the way, fluent in Ukrainian. Uh, because he was DCM in Ukraine and uh, uh, speaks excellent Ukrainian. Um, unfortunately, it's still the case. So if you look at what Putin is doing in Russia, so of course what he does to, against us is genocide, but what he does against his own people is equally horrible. So if you, he's not drafting people from Moscow or from St. Petersburg. He's drafting people from all those republics Especially, you know, some of them which we would consider a captive nations and captive republics, you know, Buryatia, uh, Chechen Republic, uh, Khabarovsky Krai, you know, every, everything in the south and far east where people are much poorer than uh, in, in central Russia. The conditions are horrible. Uh, the local languages are not developed. People actually are denied even rights to speak the languages. And they are aggressively drafted into the army, from the, from into the armed forces, and then sent to Ukraine, which frankly, they don't even know where it is on the map, and they have no idea what they're fighting for. And then, you know, we already estimate that losses of the Russian army is about 400,000 people. So um, there, there, there are complaints there, but unfortunately, the repressive regime is so big and he, they specifically target this very, um, you know, poor regions. And, and again, poor for a reason. These are regions that own the most of the Russian uh, natural resources. And yet they're the poorest regions because everything is taken by Moscow. I mean, something that we've seen in the Soviet Union. I mean, nothing new. They, con they, they continue the same uh, horrible, uh, you know, oppression against everyone else as they did in the Soviet Union, as frankly they did in the Russian Empire before that. They never were defeated proper way and never paid price for it. So, uh, you know, th th there are complaints, people understand that it's difficult, but then, you know, because Russia is not a democracy, because unlike everyone else in the region, they never did the exercise of of developing it in a rightful way. Because everyone who believed in it a little bit maybe, but and also did not want to serve, left the country in the, during the first year. I mean, almost like a million of young Russians left Russia. Uh, so what we see, what we see, of course, I mean, it's a controlled environment, of course, it's propaganda, but the majority of Russians still support it. You know, they, have, they, they support this uh, horrible concept of everyone against Russia, and Russia somehow is defending God knows what by attacking other people. I mean, uh, it's a horrible imperialistic concept, and unfortunately, we, we see the support. Now, I think it's inevitable. I don't know when it will happen, but it's, inev it's not sustainable. Not only because of the sanctions or, or something else. The concept of empire is requires the center to be oppressive of everyone and keep it all together. You need resources for that. You need strong uh, military for that, everything that he's losing in Ukraine. Uh, so this strategic mistake that he made by attacking us is, is horrible to us. I mean, we are paying the price and uh, we are losing the best of us, not only on the battlefield, but everywhere. But it's unsustainable for Russia. We will see the time when Russian empire will collapse. Now, of course, we need tougher sanctions and more support to us for to see that and to get to just and lasting peace faster because of so many losses, not only to us, I mean, to us they're horrible, but also to, to all of us. I mean, the disruption to food security, energy security, 
uh, refugees with Russia pushing, you know, we from time to time see how they're trying to push people to Finland or to, to, to Baltic states. They're trying to create challenges, not to mention their cooperation with Iran, North Korea, Hamas, you know, when they are, it's, it's just they're trying to create the destructions everywhere and ampli amplify conflicts, if not directly participate in them. Gosh, I have so much I want to ask you from that question, um, I, from your answer. I'm so glad that you brought up um, sanctions, because while the initial tranche uh, after the invasion between the U.S. and the Europeans was effective, we never followed up with secondary sanctions. So Russia, Russian banks still bank, you know, as they want. The Russian ruble is trading higher now than it was before the war. Their GDP, I think, was was actually greater than the United States last year, and of course, their energy exports still flow with, you know, very very. Free Freely. So from an economic perspective, uh, what else would you ask the United States and the EU to do? I clearly think that we needed secondary sanctions, you know, a year and a half ago. But where are you on that? On that? Uh, Thank you. That's very important point because, again, we need all the support on the battlefield. But in order for uh, getting to peace faster, the sanctions and isolation is a very important element of that. So I will start what you already said, the banking system. Uh, 55 banks are under full blocking sanctions by the U.S. Russia has 326 or seven banks. We need to sanction all Russian banks. It's very clear what we need to do. We need to implement sectoral sanctions because all Russian financial sector directly participates in the war effort. So if we do that, that will create a challenge and that will not allow Russia to continue, at least at some point, it will be big disruption because they already found this new balance. Second, when we sanction Russian banks, we clearly see that those who are still buying Russian products are very careful not to work with Russian banks, which are under U.S. sanctions, because nobody wants a risk of the secondary sanctions. And we have to explicitly be very active in the secondary sanctioning. And we have to not to allow Russia to evade them. Technology. Russia is running out of technology. Of course, they are cooperating on that with a number of countries, and they are not only buying drones from Iran and co-producing and from North Korea. They are also buying a lot and cooperating with China within the, uh, what is it called, the No Limits Partnership, mm -hmm. and with other countries. We have to tighten the sanctions in the technology area to the point that it's really difficult, if not impossible, for Russia to replenish uh, their technological base. Uh, be more proactive also on um, uh, the energy. You know, Russia is still making a lot of money uh, from selling gas and and uh, oil and uh, oil and other energy resources. Now, Europe has done tremendous efforts to free themselves from the Russian gas and and oil, but not completely. Uh, we can do that together. You know, just the last January. We have signed Ukrainian uh, transport uh, operation system with Greece and other partners in, in Europe, how we can use our transport system for the LNG from the US and other countries to actually completely replace Russia. The zero gas and oil from Russia should be the target. And we actually can do that. That will decrease their revenues, and that will help us uh, in this effort. So there is still a lot we can do. I think the main point here is that we are very grateful to the U.S. for leadership in sanctions. The packages that were uh, you know, uh, put forward in 2022 and 2023 are great, but Russia found a new balance, mm -hmm. and we need to be more proactive, and I would even say more aggressive in yeah. doing more now so that they are off that balance. And instead of thinking how they can kill better our kids and target the musical schools and hospitals and residential areas, they should be thinking how what to do with their economy. Because even in this situation now, the situation is unsustainable in Russia. But it will take way too long for us to see the result of that. And, and we all need to restore peace as soon as possible so that we can go back to actually, you know, this is... Sometimes when we talk about real challenges and problems that we all have, and not the Putin who made himself uh, the, uh, you know, there is so much that we have to take here as, as a planet, working together to address real challenges. Uh, but instead of that, we all are, have to use the resources on deterring or fighting 
with an aggressive uh, uh, person who simply decided that this is what he will do in the 21st century, the neo-imperialistic colonial war in the middle of Europe. You know, it doesn't matter which political party you're in in the U.S. We see China behind every bush lately. And uh, I know, I'm, I'm curious what the current Ukrainian relationship is with China. I know prior to the war, they were your number one tra trading partner. But as you said, uh, Xi Jinping now has a no-limits partnership uh, with Putin and has, uh, has uh, you know, approved of the invasion and, and has stood by Russia for the past two years. How does that change? Um, this war will eventually end, right? Uh, we know that, and, and you're going to still have your country standing. We all pray. How does your relationship with Russia, excuse me, with China change now, and how does it change in the future based off their uh, totally strong support for Russia's invasion? Well, first of all, um, they have been as individual country uh, the main trading partner, but European Union was already the number one if you take as the, as the union. Um, if you look at that, um, first of all, there are countries, unfortunately, that joined the war effort explicitly, like Iran and North Korea. We really are trying to communicate with China to, to, for them not to join the war effort, and hopefully because they say in UN how uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity is important for them. Well, this is a clear case of Russia breaking the territorial integrity and sovereignty. So in our peace formula effort, which President Zelensky put forward as a diplomatic pass to discuss with other nations, of course, we were glad when China joined one of the meetings, and we hope that they will join 80 countries plus now that are discussing how to restore peace in a just and lasting way, uh, you know, as, as a kind of supplementary effort to fighting on the front line, sanctions and isolation, if uh, someone in Russia at some point they will decide to stop the war and they can really stop it quick uh, because they started it, it's the war of choice for Russia. Then there will be uh, a diplomatic pass on how do we discuss you know, the uh, restoration, uh, justice and everything else. Uh, having said that, you know, when we think about reconstruction in Ukraine, it's, it's only fair for us, I mean, we clearly remember who helped us and who helps us now in actually defending ourselves. We will never forget what the U.S. has done, and hopefully we will continue doing with uh, additional support, the European Union, the 50-plus countries at the Rammstein uh, group, you know, the Ukrainian contact, co the defense contact group, which actually just uh, finished uh, in Europe uh, under the leadership of the Secretary Austin and our Minister of Defense. You know, so the countries, our prime minister, like to say united in defense, united in reconstruction. We really would like those friends, real friends, who supported us, who supported us to defend ourselves, who supported us to, uh, to, to, to survive during this horrible, difficult, for those and the companies from these countries to participate in our future reconstruction. Uh, and it's, it's up to other countries where they see themselves. Uh, are they supporting Russia? Are they supporting us? Are they sitting on the fence? But I think as time goes, as, as Russia commits more and more war crimes, as they clearly show what they are doing, I think there is less and less space to continue, be, continue uh, being neutral. And at some point, everyone will have to decide on which side of history they are. So hopefully, you know, Russia will remain with Iran and North Korea. And hopefully more countries will not join. But again, it's very difficult to say you are neutral when the information about war crimes and abducted children and tortures of civilians and all of that is out there. And again, we already lost 70 journalists and, and uh, mass media workers in Ukraine. But it's because of them the world was able to see what really happens there. Now again, I'm, I'm always coming back to uh, the 20 days in Mariupol, and we're so proud that uh, it won the Oscar this year. But you know, just just imagine for a second that this brave journalist, on the first day of war, would decide to leave rather than rush to Mariupol to be, you know, what they have to show everyone, and then 
we would not see that it was Russians who actually targeted people in Mariupol, who destroyed this uh, maternity hospital, all everything that they were able to show. Because of course, Russians are trying to lie and the propaganda and disinformation and misinformation. So we need to show it to people and we need to show it to other countries to break through the walls and put it out there in different languages, in different resources, reach out and say, this is what it is. You know, truth is our best uh, tool here. So um, I'm going to ask one last question, and then I'll open it up to audience questions. I, I want to try to you know, end on something a little positive. Um, and that's what I'd love to know what you see the future of Ukraine. What does it look like? We were just quickly chatting uh, backstage about the vast mineral resources and other natural resources that you have. No doubt Putin wants those. Um, but you know, God willing that you are able to continu continue with this fight and, and keep your country as you have for the past two years. Paint a picture for us of what Ukraine looks like five years from now, or 10 years from now. Well, this is the best exercise, which actually keeps me focused on positive, especially during difficult days. But uh, of course, all Ukrainians believe in victory. We understand it's existential for us. Uh, just 32 years of independence and one generation of Ukrainians who never lived under occupation, whether Soviet or whatever, uh, gave us sense that, you know, we never want to come back under occupation. So we will fight for our country to stay free, to stay democratic, to elect who we want to elect, to change our leaders on a regular basis. There is no way we're going back uh, to whatever. So th this is the fight uh, for our life. And I really hope that the victory will come soon because uh, that will require, that that is required in order for this picture that I I'm, I'm, we are working on uh, will, will to, to happen. But even though we are fighting now, we already are doing what is needed for this Ukraine of the future. So first, we are working hard on reforms. We are reforming our economy. We are uh, taking, uh, changing laws in order to become members of the European Union. And actually, European Union gave us candidacy status even during the war because we complied with the conditionalities. And we just two, three days ago signed, uh, adopted a plan on this four-year plan for the European facility to move to move on our path to the European Union. So the future Ukraine is, of course, peaceful Ukraine, which is member of the European Union, and in my mind, member of NATO, of course. Uh, but actually, what we have in mind for the reconstruction of Ukraine is, is a very exciting plan. Uh, we would like to, as President Zelensky says, to leapfrog. And instead of rebuilding what we used to have, uh, use the best technologies that are there in order for not only Ukraine to become very innovative, and again, we are very digital already, we are, we are transforming every sector. Actually, being digital helped us during the war, that our banking system never stopped working because it went into the cloud. And because every banking, we have this concept which is called power banking, that even during the blackouts during winter, we have bank branches with the Starlink and, and the generator. And even when we had blackout, the banking system worked. I think this is the first time during the war when, when the banking system worked. Um, we have really rich natural resources, which uh, were not developed you know, before, like lithium and others. And uh, we have very highly educated people. Engineering and math has been our strongest sides. That's why the startups and uh, digital economy is growing even again during the war. The agriculture, I mean, Ukraine was always called the breadbasket of Europe. We, uh, before the war started and before Russians started blocking the ports, we were number one exporter in sunflower oil and in top five exporters of uh, uh, wheat, barley, a, a lot of uh, uh, agricultural produce. We can do even more because Ukraine owned about 30% according to different estimates of the world's black soil which is very rich and the climate is good. And, you know, it, before, when I was the Minister of Finance in my previous life and uh, a private equity person, every presentation about Ukraine started with the country was on the, with the strategic location, on the crossroads of uh, Europe and Asia, uh, uh, with a great transport system, with natural resources, highly educated, 98% literacy workforce, with an unrealized potential. And we, we always could not realize that potential, frankly, because ever since 1998, the Russia started exporting their greatest good to us, corruption, 
and uh, you know, uh, really, really, um, you know, the, a number of pro-Russian or sometimes Russian-owned governments. Really, you know, this, this big oil and gas corruption, which has been what we call the president's corruption. And only in 2013, we started working on this comprehensive real reforms on cleaning the system, creating, lowering the space for corruption, created the anti-corruption institutions, which really fight with corruption. Even now during the war, I mean, our chief justice was indicted uh, last year. It's bad thing that he had to be indicted on a bribery case. It's great that even chief justice in the country is not untouchable, and if something bad happens, then, then the system works. So there is a lot still to be done. There is a lot to be done to attract compliant business from especially uh, U.S. and European Union, but you know, my KPI is, of course, American business uh, uh, to, to attract. But I see a very bright future in which Ukraine is part of the solution to so many global challenges and very reliable partner for American uh, friends. You know, we could be strategic friends not only in how we defend democracy and fight for freedom, but also in how we flourish and help, you know, both of our nations uh, get better and, and, and prosper. But of course, in order to get there, we need to win the war first. Yes, you do. Okay, I think we probably have a roving microphone. The lights are in my eyes, but I do see a couple hands back there and I'll just let you guys go ahead. Um, slightly loaded question. Um, what are your thoughts about the upcoming U.S. presidential election? <laughs> I'm sure uh, she's never asked that. <laughs> My favorite one. Uh, well, actually, on the one hand, and, um, you know, we fight for our homes and for our loved ones, but we also fight for democracy. And we fight for the ability of people to choose what they want to choose, to elect who they want to elect. So it's up to American people who they elect. And we are strategic friends with America, not with Democratic Party, not with Republican Party, but with all Americans. So whoever American people elect, we will work and we will tirelessly develop the strategic partnership that we have and which we very, very v value. Now, sometimes it's even more loaded questions. So people ask me about specific candidates. And then in, in, in the history of Ukraine, you know, I always say, look, we're very grateful to President Biden, to administration for everything we have provided and for great relations that we have. We also have to remind people that it was Secretary Pompeo who actually signed and adopted the Crimean Declaration. He was the first Secretary of State who said Crimea is Ukraine. Here is the Crimean Declaration. And everyone after that stood up by that. It was President Trump who made the decision to provide us lethal aid which was so much needed and asked since 2014. But the first javelins came with uh, Secretary Trump's signature. So, you know, look, uh, I understand, of course, the election year is very difficult in any country. And it's going to be challenging. And you have to, in order to be elected, you have to fight. And it's a very um, difficult, challenging time for us because we have to fight and keep united support here. Uh, so my goal is, and I truly believe in this, you know, that this issue is bipartisan issue, and we want it to remain bipartisan, because the fight for freedom and democracy and the values on which your country is built and our country is built is above and beyond political uh, differences or electoral differences. So it's difficult, but it's part of being a democracy. And we will try to just stay consistent as we did before, saying that we need the American support and we need bipartisan support. And for some reason, I, I believe, you know, this this will uh, remain like this. And hopefully, you know, the, we will be past the election and, uh, you know, there will be other questions about other challenges. But, you know, it's democracy. Okay. Who's next? Let's see. Right over here. Thank you. Um, Madam Ambassador, I'd like to ask you about, on the upside, uh, you've great experience with Invest Ukraine and startup activity. I know there are a lot of people in this region of the country who are interested in making a capitalist contribution uh, in response to what's going on. 
And uh, there's a Ukraine student here in Tennessee who's studying the resiliency of Ukraine entrepreneurs during this war. And there's a long list of people in relief activities, et cetera. Uh, are you thinking about, through other organizations or your own, building new bridges to entrepreneurial communities in our region and elsewhere? Yes, absolutely. So uh, I believe not only we can do a lot together, so anyone who's interested, I always say, please treat our embassy as your embassy as well. Contact us, and we are more than happy and ready to either put people who are interested in contact with Ukrainian business, bring them here, organize visits there, we have some states organizing uh, and organized trips to Ukraine. We also started working on state to oblast partnerships. Just recently, one signed is between uh, the state of Washington and Kiev oblast. We're working on others. So my goal, uh, as I enter soon, will enter into my fourth year of uh, uh, service as an ambassador here, is to create as many we call them people-to-people -people connections, but business-to-business, entrepreneurship, entrepreneur-entrepreneur, university-to-university, because first, there is a lot we can do together, and there is a lot of business activity and co-production. We, by the way, are very active in the defense co-production, especially this new uh, high-tech, mil-tech, you know, the drones that we produce in Ukraine, which are uniquely Ukrainian, but uh, you know, we can, we can, we would be more than happy to share it also with the world. Uh, but also, uh, there is a lot of lessons learned. You know, uh, the 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 way Putin's war disrupted the supply chains and uh, uh, transport uh, corridors and everything else, and the way uh, we actually were able to be resilient from banking system to other businesses. There is a lot of lessons learned for other businesses which you can even apply during the peaceful times. So we really, this is something which we see as our mission also. I mean, we didn't choose this. I wish as, again, uh, the uh, producer of the 20 days in Mariupol, when he was doing his speech, he said, I wish I, 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 w I was never, I, I should not do this movie to win this. You know, so we didn't ask for this. I wish we were less resilient, but peaceful, you know. but but. But this is where we are, so now we just want to share it and make the best use of it. So I really, and as a former private equity person and former minister of finance, I can tell to any business, this is the time to put Ukraine on, on your map. This is the time to get in contact with us or with business associations or with US Chamber of Commerce uh, and, and, and start looking at it. This is the time to actually think about potential investment in Ukraine. When we will win, and we will start rapidly development, it's going to be already too late. This is the time to, to do it now. And please use us as a resource. Let's try to get a student in. I think I saw a student, any students have questions? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, um, thank you first of all for, for taking the time with us. My question is, is if you could take us back to the winter of 2021 to early 2022, as the Russian buildup began, could you please elucidate upon your role as the ambassador during this difficult time and the conversations that occurred at the onset of war? Thank you. Let me take you back to actually April of 21 when I arrived as an ambassador. And literally months after that, uh, there was first Russian buildup near the border. And uh, they pretended that was an exercise. Uh, remember, there was a summit between Putin and President Biden. They pretended to get to, to the summit that they actually co completed the exercises and moved. And we were the ones who were uh, publicly telling everywhere they took the personnel out, they left the equipment. Uh, it's not just the exercise. So all summer of 2021, we realized that the buildup is happening there, there and in the north, in Belarus. And we worked on three priorities with our strategic partners here, with administration, but also with Congress. How to deter Russia from attacking, and that uh, what you know, first, military. So we needed and we, we asked the US to provide us wo more support in order to show Russians that we actually have more capabilities, and if they attack us, it's going to cost them. 
Second, sanctions. There was a very profound work that we've done, and Embassy has been working a lot. There was uh, you know, a lot of my time devoted to that, uh, which was very useful, although we couldn't convince our partners to do the preemptive sanctions, which we thought were necessary. But they were, at the point, so developed on specific objects, specific people, specific companies, that they were able to introduce them both here in the US and in Europe literally next day after the invasion started. That was a lot of work actually leading towards it. Now, when President Zelensky visited uh, Washington in September 2021, we signed a very important, not public, but the resume from it is, is public, uh, a framework defense uh, cooperation framework agreement between the Department of, of uh, Defense and our Ministry of Defense, uh, which actually laid out plan of our cooperation in that area for the next five years, which is a very important strategic document together with the Strategic Partnership Charter, which we updated in November 2021. All of that laid out foundation for actually su supporting us with the first presidential drawdown, which was announced in December 2021, and then all January, you saw the public information about planes after planes uh, getting from Dover and other bases from here to Kiev and unloading these javelins and everything else. We tried together with you know, a communication of so many European leaders and the US who called Putin and told them directly, you know, don't you do that. He lied to all of them. Uh, as close, I think, as two days before the invasion, he had some conversations, and his Minister of Foreign Affairs had conversations and literally lied to people that it's all an, a, a hysteric publications, he's not gonna do it, two days before they, they invaded. But we, you know, since literally mid-2021, there was constant work in three directions. Defense support, weapons, 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 sanctions and isolation, preparing these packages and telling, and, and third, in general, support to Ukraine in order for us to be more resilient. So for example, if you look at my Facebook uh, publications, we actually started working on with uh, SpaceX and Starlink on un uh, doing that capability in Ukraine because we didn't have it a couple of months before that. And we agreed on everything uh, in January, so that's why we were able to do it so fast when we needed it. And there were many other areas in which we focused because again, all of us tried to do everything possible to deter, but you know, unfortunately we also realized that this mass of uh, equipment and personnel that he was bringing closer to our borders for quite consistently for some time there was a very high chance and we were getting ready. And, uh, you know, we also prepared a lot of communication. I mean, maybe in some time in the future when we win and we can declassify some of things, you know, but, but you know, how do you prepare for the war? I mean, we were, we were also preparing at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to what if we don't have connection with Kyiv? What if, uh, you know, so, so, how the embassies will operate, how the embassies will contact with our key partners when the Kiev will rely on us, you know. So there was a lot of work that went into preparation, of course, with hope and praise that we will never have to use it. Unfortunately, we did. Uh, and, and then, you know, it's 24-7, every day after 22nd of February, doing some things for the first time. Because again, even if you prepare yourself, there is nothing that can, can prepare you for the full-fledged war. Well, we have to get the ambassador to a reception and to the airport, and I'm sure many of you want to meet her. So let's do one more question if we can. I think there's another hand. Thanks so much for your time with us. Um, a number of years ago, I hosted a young man from Kiev in my home while he was getting um, health care here in the US. and so. We've stayed in touch, and he's now a young man who's been, whose life is being impacted by the war, right? These are the young generation who's not you know, able to complete their education because they're going to fight the war or you know, their career is being um, disrupted. And I know we've talked a lot about how we can support militarily, but I'm part of the Peabody College of Human Development here, and so we think about how can we help you now as a partner for these young generations who are going to be long-term impacted in terms of their human capital development, what they can do for your reconstruction in the future? 
Thank you. Very important question. And actually, this has been a uh, key topic of my discussions with a number of people here at the university before uh, I got here, uh, talking about, A, how can we cooperate more? And we already have many partnerships with universities so that we are not moving the people here, but we actually allow our researchers and, and science and other uh, professors who are in Ukraine to join this uh, uh, common projects, continue not only uh, evolving themselves, but also doing their research, publishing, and also teaching the students. Second, so many schools and universities are literally physically destroyed or damaged. There is not a, a, a week that Russians are not targeting specifically educational institutions. Uh, some of them, like Mariupol University, is completely destroyed, and they moved to Kyiv, and our Ministry of Education are providing to them with additional space so they can actually continue. Some of them joining uh, other universities so that their students do not lose it. Uh, I'm very grateful to the U.S. that they have actually extended possibilities for students who were here, even on short programs, to stay and continue their education and wait fees. Uh, so there is a lot we can do together there because, frankly, you know, our reconstruction will significantly depend on whether we will be able to not only sustain our uh, science and education and everything else, but also continue and expand. Uh, and also schools, you know, let's let's take a look at the at the uh, our schools. You know, Just again, last week we have signed agreement with licensing agreement with Smithsonian. Uh, we are now will be using the science in classroom for first graders to eight to five graders, uh, which is going to be very useful, especially for those schools on the on the front lines uh, or near the front lines where kids either cannot can come back to to education full time or have to go to bomb shelter five times a day, for example. What kind of education is that, right? So we need to be more creative in order, on the one hand, to to continue educating and not to lose the whole generation, uh, but also to be very, not only resilient, but creative about how we do it. And any cooperation in that, whether it's school to school, university to university, uh, we are actually working a lot with the teachers union here. Uh, they, they traveled a number of times already to Ukraine. They work with our teachers on, on how to do it, how to help, any help there, is really crucial because this is, uh, you know, it's going to be, our president always says, national security and defense is priority number one. Education is also priority number one. He understands that and he always keeps telling us that this is what we have to focus all the resources on. Uh, it helps also, like I always say, I'm the uh, daughter of two engineers. Uh, his uh, father is professor at the university, so that helps, of course, uh, in, in, in putting the, the right perspective. But this is very important. And whatever, uh, let me again use the opportunity to say thank you to all who help us in this, and also say please do more. And reach out, and we at the embassy would be more than happy to, to put you in contact with and find the opportunities. Well, Ambassador, you are a warrior, you're a lioness, and we're so grateful that you came to Nashville while you are literally fighting for your country's existence. Um, and it's not lost on us that you uh, have a million things going on, especially trying to get the supplemental through. Um, so we're so grateful that you spent time here. And, and again, thank you to the Chancellor, Dr. Gere, for being so committed to debate and dialogue. Uh, we are just so proud to have you. And thank you so much. And God bless Ukraine. Thank you, and God bless America.